you know, this week we're finishing up the Sefer Vayikra, the book of Leviticus. The Sefer Vayikra is called Torah's Kohanim, the laws pertaining to Kohanim. The sacrifices, the species, what is the species qualified, what is not qualified, how one officiates, who's qualified to officiate, all laws pertaining to that. There's certain offerings that you bring, sacrifices, that besides officiating by slaughtering it, one has to wave it. It's called waving of the offering. What's waving? Let's say it's a meal offering. The Kohen and the one who brings the meal offering, he lifts it up and down. Vertically lifts it up, down, and then he takes it and waves it outward and inward. That's what it's called. It's called the waving of the offering. Where do we find wavering besides bringing the carbon, the, the offering? And sometimes you take the sheep, the small sheep, the one who brings the sheep, you wave the sheep. You lift it up, down, in and out. The four species we take on Sukkot, the lulav, the myrtle, the willow, they're all bound together, and you have an esro. You have the citron, and you hold it together. We wave it. We wave it in, out, up, and down. It's also called waving. It's the waving of the four species. And he was called tenufa. Now, what ex exactly is the symbolism and the significance of the waving? So the Gemara tells us in Sukkah, and some other locations, it's to ward off destructive rains and destructive winds. When you wave it in every direction, it's like you're pushing away, it creates an energy which prevents destructive winds and destructive rains to come about. Which, and the result of that is blessing. That is the symbolism of waving. Also do. The two the different types of do. Do is essential for, for the existence of the world. You can have do in Hebrew is called tau. You can have bad tau. Do which is detrimental to existence. It doesn't allow that to happen. Keeps it at arm's length. Keeps it away. But it's an action. How does waving it? You know, if you see a fire, God forbid, burning, and it's approaching, and you take your hand, and you wave your hand at the fire. Do you think the fire's going away? It's not going away. But here, when you wave the lulav with the four species, inward, outward, up and down, or you take the meal offering in the temple, and you follow the protocol, wave it in and out, the sheep lift it up and down and in and out, this wards off all kinds of terrible things from happening in the world. Why? Because when you wave your hand at the fire, that's not a symbolism. You know, you should be running in the other direction when you see the fire coming. But God says innately, when you do that, it creates an energy. But why? Because that meal offering that you're bringing, being consecrated, being of a certain species, and being brought by the owner, and the Kohen participating in it, that itself represents an energy in the spiritual realm, which does not allow something which interferes and undermines that spiritual energy, which is positive. That's what it is. So all that exists within existence, it's all due to God releasing energies. And when he releases the energies as they should be released, the world has bracha. We're blessed. The world thrives. There's no illness. There's no disease. People are able to focus on what they're supposed to focus. God forbid, if people misbehave, God says, if that's the case, that creates a negative energy. I withdraw from existence. When God withdraws, everything starts faltering. If everything starts coming apart at the seams. You know, you have... We find the Torah is compared to water. 
Talmud says the water, the Torah is contained to three liquids, water, wine, and milk. What's the characteristic characteristic of water? It flows from an upper lo, a higher location to a lower location. So what does it take away for us? The Torah is, just as water is the source of life, the Torah for a Jew is the source of it, the life of his spirituality. We see Talmud Torah can get kulam. One word of Torah is the equivalent of all 613 mitzvahs. The grace and fusion of spiritual energy into our souls comes from the study of Torah. So therefore, Torah and water, however, just as water the characteristic is, it flows to a low look from a high location, from an incline to a low location, the Torah can only be acquired or processed by personal humility. But if you lack in humility, the divine intervention to give you that understanding, to grasp it properly, is denied to that person. You have to be humble. You have to take on the characteristic of water, to have relevance to the water, to the spiritual water. Every night in my riv, the, we say in the closing bracha before the Shema, Keheim Chayenu Varuch The Torah is our life. Keheim Chayenu, the length of our days. Uvehem Negabo Yom And in the Torah, I will meditate, study day and night. That's what we say. So, what's the life of a Jew? What's the source of the soul that the soul functions and advances? It's the Torah itself. So just as the water, if a person is not hydrated, you dehydrate and you wither identically the soul of a Jew unless it's hydrated by the spiritual water, which is the Torah, also there's a, a dehydration. It starts withering, drying it up, and ultimately it remains with nothing. Same idea. But where is it? How? Why does that, when I study... Physics, it doesn't infuse my soul with anything. When you study the words of the Torah, somehow it does that. It touches your soul. The answer is, who's the creator of the human being God? Certain things we, we could take to a lab, analyze it under a microscope with various tests. Out in the Shema, there's no way to analyze it. The soul only God knows the makeup of the soul. God knows what's beneficial for the soul, and he knows what's detrimental for the soul. And he set the rules. And he set the protocol. How to maintain it, how to advance it, and how to destroy it. That's what it's about. So whatever we do, you'll say, why tefillin? Why tefillin is so important? The hand, I didn't say it corresponds to the heart. But if I wear, would wear some kind of radio transmitter on my arm and it would give more pulses and would touch my heart, would it make a difference? Not in the spiritual realm, it wouldn't. Or you put something on your head. Instead of the leather box, which is prescribed in the Torah, it would have nothing to do with your spirituality. It has nothing with, you, with your brain. Unless you put these electrodes on your brain and there's some kind of pulses going in there but it has nothing to do with your spirituality. That touches your physicality. Or Shiva, a blessed memory, he studied in the Lithuanian Yeshiva in the early part of the 20th century. It was called Slabotka. It was a suburb of Kovna, which was in... Lithuania, and he had the personality of that type of Torah sage who was mentored and studied in that kind of yeshiva. And there was a doctor, I want to mention this, his name was Dr. Seidel. He was a medical doctor, he came to the United States in the earlier part of the 20th century and became a medical doctor. And he opened a practice in downtown Baltimore. There was a street called East Utah Street. When I came in the 60s, you know, the police would walk around with German shepherds patrolling the streets. That's how dangerous the streets were. And if you drive through the streets, the police would see that your button was up 
they would say, make sure to close the button on your on, on the door of your car. Because as you're driving, somebody could pull open the door and pull me out. That's what kind of, and this doctor, he opened his office in 1918. And now fast forward to early 60s, he still has his office. He's still practicing medicine there, East Utah Street. And he himself was a Lithuanian Jew. His name was Dr. Seidel. And if you walk into his office, some of the equipment he had, it's like if you go to Smithsonian and you look at the type of uh, equipment the doctors used during the Civil War on, on, the, on the soldiers, it, some of the equipment looks similar to that. Huh. That's, it looked like archaic. But he was a phenomenal diagnos diagnostician and he was a genius. And he himself studied with Rabbi Chana Wasserman, when they were young men in Europe. And if, whenever my Rosh Hashim would come to his office for medical, for medical reasons, the office could be filled with people immediately. He says, the rabbi goes first. And he couldn't care less if the people would wait, if they would leave. The rabbi, and he was older than my Rosh Hashim. He was about 10 years older, maybe 15 years older. But he gave him tremendous respect. He was not an observant Jew. Although he learned as a young man with Rabbi Wasserman, he was not observant. As Dr. Seidel. He walked in, he had a, a credenza. Today people know what a credenza is. I'm not sure in Bowie, Maryland, they had credenzas. It was like a, a piece of furniture which had glass doors on it, and you kept things in there. He had a Vilna Shas in this credenza. Not that he used it, but he had it in his office. And he says to my Roshiv, he says, you know, when I studied Re Rebbe Chano Wasserman, who was one of the leading Torah sages, who was killed in 1942 in the Covenant Fort, I had a better head than, than Rebbe Chano Wasserman. I had a better head than he did. That's what he says to my Roshiv. So my Roshiv says to him, he says, you may have had a better head. But Rebbe Chano Wasserman developed, he was one of the leading Torah sages in the world. And where, where are you? In this forsaken East Utah street, a red light district, where the police have to go with German shepherds to patrol the streets. That's where you are. So don't pride yourself. Don't boast. So he says, you know, something's always been bothering me. Jews with filling. It's a leather box. You wear it on your arm. You have leather straps. They're black. And you wear it on your head. He says, it doesn't make sense. It's a piece of leather with parchment with some writing on the on the on the on the parchment stitched. How does that ha how does that somehow do things for us and make a difference in our lives as Jews? He says, I don't get it. Okay. So the way we're explaining everything is symbolisms. If you meet the criteria which Torah sets for what tefillin are, square, black, made of a certain material, and with a certain intent. And the text on the, the parchment, the certain text, it generates an energy. That energy activates other energies. And that, that's the infusion to your soul and maintains, gives you connection to eternity. That's, that's, that's the understanding. And Rashiv answered him very simple. He says, you're a doctor. You understand the human being has a brain. You take the brain of Einstein and take the brain of a retarded person. The brain matter is the same brain matter, except one person's retarded, and one person is the upper echelon of genius, but they both have the same brain. One person develops the theory of relativity, and you, you create the atom bomb, which you can destroy the whole world, and the other person he has to be fed because he doesn't need, he, he's barely functional. They both have a brain. What's the difference? So you'll tell me because there's a chemical activity in the brain and due to that chemical activity and the way things happen, one's genius, one's ordinary. So he says, you see, you understand. That's the difference. When you create this box made of a certain material, a certain color, and it's processed and meets the criteria which God sets, it creates a certain activity, a certain energy activity. That energy ultimately 
transcends this existence and touches our soul, and therefore we have relevance to eternity. As you understand the difference between the brain of, of Einstein, the brain of a, of a retarded person, that's the difference between an ordinary leather box and the box meeting the criteria, which is set by the Torah. That's what, it's a symbolism. You do this, activates that. No, you have receptors. A receptor receives, and a person tries to copy what a receptor looks like. Cone shaped, everything else, but doesn't receive. Because the wiring or the components which give it that capacity are missing. Say, well, what difference does it make? Because if you understand the way, the way it functions, you'll understand what the difference is. If you understand this, you'll understand why. But we don't understand why. Only God knows. That's what we said yesterday, two days ago, that the, the essence of every Torah law in itself is really a statute. God doesn't share us the reason why. We relate to value. Why not to steal? Why not to kill? Why not to do certain things? That's ethical moral. But that ethical moral takeaway has nothing to do with why God dictated and gave us that commandment. He gave us the commandment only he knows. Because that has to do with our spiritual makeup. And since we have an obligation to advance it and not to d- diminish it, it should advance, not regress. Therefore, he gave us these protocols, which are called statutes. But this makes sense. That doesn't make sense. The way you understand it makes sense, but that's what it's all about. I'll give you an example. There's a, a bulletproof vest. It's made of a certain material. I'm not, I, I, I forgot what it's called. I think it's called, even though I know it's a, an antibiotic, I think it's called Keflex. Norman, Keflex is, a, is an antibiotic. Kevlar. No, Keflex. Kevlar. What? Kevlar. 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 Or, or he, the, we're told the detective, uh, detective Diamond there. He knows Kevlar. Okay. <laughs> A person puts on the vest. What does he put on the vest? The, the vest weighs as, is very heavy. And it costs a fortune. To supply the whole New York Police Department, you know, when they defunded the police, they couldn't afford both per vest. So they say, no, you put on, you put on a designer's sweatshirt. That'll do the job. You're not going to have much of a police force by the time you're finished with that, rather than the, the Kevlar bulletproof vest. Person puts on the vest, you know why? Of course, it keeps him warm. It keeps you warm. But if you understand what that vest is all about, the value of the vest is not to keep you warm. But that's my takeaway, because when I put it on and it's cold, it warms me. That's your takeaway. But if you understand the innate value, that's not what the vest is all about. That if God forbid somebody shoots a projectile at you, that vest will be able to stop it from penetrating the material to go into your body. Lahabdi. We have takeaways. Don't steal, don't lie, be honest. This, the, the, their ownership rights make sense because you can't have a society unless you do that. But that's not why God gave it. That's our takeaway. That's the way we process it. It's for and this has to do with our spiritual makeup, the spiritual profile of our soul. Nothing to do with what we understand. Of course, we have benefit from it because we, our takeaway has great value because we behave like a human being because of that. And we behave ethically and morally because of that. But that's not the reason. You know, years ago, when you gave children cough medicine, they had to sweeten it. It tastes like, 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 like cherry syrup because otherwise the child's not taking that medication. Of course, then it's unadulterated form, it's bitter. But so the child thinks he's drinking a sweet, a sweet uh, liqueur. That's what it is. That's what, that's what you're processing it. But what it's doing to you, it's going to rest the cough and you're not going to have the croup. That's what it's about. It's the exact same thing. Shlomo Melech authored a Megillah. It's called Kohelis. 
Kohelis, he speaks about the vanity of existence. And he says, there's nothing new under the sun. Within the physical world, it's always the same, more or less of the same. So the Midrash says, under the sun, there's nothing new. But above the sun, meaning it's the spiritual world, this continuous renewal. The world is finite fixed. However, that's under the sun. That's within the physical realm. But in the spiritual realm, there's always things happening. The world either advances or regresses, the spiritual world. But he ends his last words of Kohelos, the closing words. Sof davar At the end of time, when the sheikh comes, Akol Nishma. Everything will be known. There's no secrets. People behave us away. We, we keep it on, on the QT. At the end of time, everything we revealed about every human being. And the embarrassment is going to be not to be believed. Because when word gets out, how people behave, what we do, what we think, it's going to be a shameful moment. So Dover Akol Nishma. At the end of time, everybody, everything's been brought out, out in the open. Es elokim yiroch. Therefore, fear God. Because that is the essence of man. Man, to function as he's meant to function, that is the totality of the human being. Es elokim yiroch. You want to toe the line? You know how to toe the line? You have a, a safety rope. You tie it around the person's waist. They say, it's not enough. You have to hold on to it. And you have to teach him how to hold on to it. How do you hold on to for life? To maintain your humanity as a spiritual person. The lifeline is You must fear God. Revere God. That is the totality of man. Without that, you become a predator. You live like an intellectual animal. There's nothing we can't justify due to our conflicts. But if you fear God and you understand he knows what you don't know and whatever he prescribes, it's now best interest, then you truly, that Adam, as we said, Adam comes from the word Adama, from the earth, it's all potential. Then you're able to develop from that some things which are not fathomable and that's only if you follow God's script. But if you follow, you march to your own tune, you know, you're marching somewhere else. You're not marching in the right direction. You know, uh, there's a beautiful midrash. Hashem says to, to Yaakov, kafar or it's, your progeny will be like the dust of the earth. So the midrash says, what is dust? Dust has a very negative connotation. It's worthless, dust. You say you'll be like the stars of the heaven. The stars is, is something majesty, magnificent. Dust of the earth, what is it? So the Midrash tells us it's a known fact that every civilization that enslaved the Jews, that civilization doesn't exist any longer. They went into the dustbins of history. The Babylonians, the Medes and the Persians, the Greeks, the Romans. They all exiled the Jews. They persecuted the Jews. Where are they? Not here anymore. They're no longer world powers. The dictate existence. Why? They're gone, but we're still here. So the Midrash explains it with an allegory, beautiful allegory. You have soldiers marching into a country to take over the country. They wear their beautiful uniforms, their battle fatigues clean. And as they come in, they march. When they march and they stamp, they trample on that earth, on that, that dust, what happens? The dust rises, covers their uniforms. But over time, they trample, they step enough on that dust, it rises and they're totally consumed by that dust. The Jewish people have a characteristic that if you pound us long enough, you're going to be consumed through us. As the dust rises and totally covers the person who tramples on it, 
the nation that tramples on the Jew, ultimately, they're going to be destroyed through us because we're going to overcome them and they're going to be subsumed by us. That is the characteristic of the Jew. But it does make sense. Statistically, it shouldn't be. Any nation that's gone through what the Jewish nation have gone through, their history, they don't exist. Why does the Jewish people exist? We defy every statistic, every odds. How? The answer is statistic is within the physical realm. Statistic is not within the, the, the spiritual realm. As a result of that, since the Jew is unique in his spiritual profile, therefore, what the world is subject to, we're not subject to. Of course, we could be compromised physically like the non-Jew. But in terms of our existence, because what we represent, we're eternal. Therefore, we cannot be become extinct. Because what we are is not relevant to, ex to extinction. 